All right, good morning and a welcome to Adventure of Faith. We are here this morning. Uh, whether you're in person, in your car, at home, we are one body in Christ here to worship God. So I invite you to stand up and join me this morning as we start our service worshiping God. This is a thousand tongues. Yeah. 
this morning as we turn our attention toward the screens and check out what's going on with the Life at Adventure. Good morning, Adventure family. Welcome to church today. Whether you are in the worship center, in the friendship center with me, in the parking lot, at home, or later on YouTube, we are so glad you've joined us. We've got a little on-site update for you. The last couple of weeks, the worship center was at about max capacity given the current restrictions. If you are in the building, you may have actually noticed today that we have rearranged both the worship center and the friendship center to better accommodate people. We are hoping you might consider alternating which side of the building you worship on each week. There's a couple of reasons for this and we wanted to invite you into that conversation. We are actually welcoming new people into our building almost every week. They tend to come through the main doors and welcoming them into the worship center is an easy way to extend that kind of radical hospitality we want to embody. Also, one of the things we've come to love about this one service is this adventure family feel. Uh, we get to chat in the parking lot. We get a touch of that connection and community and togetherness. It's about worshiping together as the church, with, which can happen in a variety of locations. We'll move to two services when we need to, and we are excited to be seeing more people in person, but the building isn't full yet, and if we move to two services too early, we'll lose some of that togetherness we've built. We hope you'll join us as we try to navigate the current restrictions, uh, loving people well, and being together as best we can to worship. Base Camp kicked off last week with our new theme, Adventure. In fact, for February, March, and April, Base Camp will be digging into our church's three core values, which are adventure, discipleship, and authenticity. We hope you'll join us as we explore what it means to be devoted to the mission of the church through our values. If you haven't joined us yet, this would be a great time to jump in. There are so many ways to participate at home or online with your family or with a neighbor or a small group. Base Camp is all about supporting, challenging, equipping, um, and encouraging you to live out this adventure of faith. If you need to pick up this month's supply box for your group, you can find it by the main doors uh, anytime the church building is open. Good morning. We wanted to give you an update on Mazatlan. Our team will not be going on our mission trip this upcoming summer. We are all very disappointed in this, but I can't wait to see how God works in us and through us over the next year. We also wanted to share with you that our feeding center hosts, Chewy and Lucero, have decided to step down as the feeding center hosts at Montebello. Their lives have gotten very busy with four children. We hope 
you will join us in prayer for the next family to step in as host family. Speaking of Montebello, our partners in Mexico and us have the opportunity to purchase the land next door to Montebello to build a new home for the upcoming host family. We'll be bringing you more regular updates from the outreach team, so more details on this to come. Okay, calling all Trek students and leaders. Mark your calendars for February 28th at 12.30 p.m. for our second attempt at Nerf Wars. Uh, Trek will meet in the Friendship Center at 12.30 for a group devotional and then transition into games. Eat lunch before you come, write your initials on all your darts, grab your mask, and we will see you there. If you have any questions or concerns, you can contact Caitlin or Karen. My name is Maddie. In Adventure Kids, we are learning that the church to glorify God, show his love, and tell others about Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Adventureland Preschool opened up its registration for the 2021-22 school year. To find uh, class descriptions or to register, please head to the website at faithadventure.com slash adventureland preschool or contact Colleen for more details. Hey, Pastor John, just like last week, I need you to uh, cover your ears again. Okay, now that he's not listening, we wanted to reach out and say that with Pastor John's retirement coming up in a couple of months, we have some ideas in the works for how we can celebrate him and show him some love. If you are interested in submitting a memory in celebration, uh, photos, uh, written words, quick videos, please contact me, Sam, at uh, sam at faithadventure.com uh, for details. And then keep your eyes peeled for more info on how we'll be trying to celebrate together as best we can in March. Thanks for joining us for Life at Adventure. No matter where you are today, we are glad you chosen to worship with us. Lord, how can we thank you enough for your sacrifice? Do not let us take it for granted today, but let us realize the greatness of your gift, the greatness of your love. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Amelia. I invite you to stand and join with me once again as we continue in worship with uh, an old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, so.
God, please help us to remember to turn our eyes upon you, God. When we can be so consumed with the things of this world, with, with having what we want and doing what we want and being right, God, that you offer a gift that is so much greater than anything we could desire here on earth, God. Help us to remember to turn our eyes upon you to look to you, to put our faith and our hope in you, God, because you are the only one that can fill us. God, this morning as we move into a time of hearing the message, I pray that you would give the words to Pastor John that you want us to hear, that we could be touched this morning, that we could know you better, that we could better understand the stories of Jesus that we've heard through your word, God. Help us to be more like you. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Adventure. I see uh, most of the people who are here present in the building today are ex-Baptists. <laughs> Nobody sits in the front two rows. Okay? You guys must be permanent Presbyterians or something. Or Episcopalians. Yeah, yeah. How do you like the new setup? Yeah. Eh, yeah, it's, uh, we decided to try it just because having a bunch of chairs all stacked up in our meeting place was kind of ugly. Um, Y'all need to come to Iowa. Yeah, they have the governor there just removed all indoor mask wearing restrictions. And people wanted to know why I was moving to Iowa. <laughs> no. Um, well, anyway, um, we uh, are in the middle of um, a series on, we're calling it More About Jesus, where we're, we're seeing some things that Luke 
reveals to us about Jesus that we did not see in the book of John. Okay? So, we're going to dive in today and, and take a look at communion. And we're going to celebrate communion at the end of the service. If you're at home and you want to get out some bread and some juice or wine or whatever you use, uh, feel free to be ready uh, when we get to the end of the service and we'll uh, celebrate together. Now, I have uh, never been to Washington, D.C. Never. I'm not sure I would want to go today, but <laughs> I, I understand that one of the most impressive of all the monuments in the Washington, D.C. area is the Vietnam War Memorial. And it's kind of funny that the one war that we take the least pride in as a country is the one with the biggest memorial. And I think the reason is um, it's so personal. I mean, etched in the um, granite on the Vietnam Wall are the names of 58,156 men and women who died in Vietnam. And visitors to the monument can look up the names of people they may know. And they touch, or they, sometimes they trace the name of that person on a piece of paper. And they remember. Now, just hours before Jesus died, he established a memorial that has endured for nearly 2,000 years, over 2,000 years. And Jesus knew how short our memories are, so he established a memorial that we call communion to serve as a reminder of his death to all of us. And this is more important than any man-made monument. Okay? The, the, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that um, many had either been neglecting or abusing the Lord's Supper, he said, and they had become, as a result, spiritually weak and sick. And so it's very important to you and to me as Christians to understand the significance of the Lord's Supper and of proper participation in this spiritual feast which helps us to grow stronger in the Christian life. We're going to celebrate communion today, as I said, and I'm hoping that today's message will profoundly deepen our experience of the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 21 introduces us to Jesus' participation in the Passover and his um, introduction of communion. The original story of the Passover is found in the book of Exodus. It's celebrated at the end of March or early April every year. And what the 4th of July is to America, the Passover is to Israelites, to Jewish people. Because for 400 years they had been held bondage in Egypt. They were in slavery. And after God sent a series of nine terrible plagues on the Egyptians, Pharaoh still suddenly refused, just stubbornly refused, to release the slaves. And so God instructed the two million Hebrew slaves to prepare for the worst plague of all, the plague of death on the firstborn of all of Egypt. And God said, about midnight I will go about Egypt and every firstborn son of Egypt will die. And there will be loud wailing in Egypt, worse than there ever has been or ever will be again. But God promised the Jewish people that the angel of death would pass over their home if they killed a lamb or a young goat, and they took the blood of that animal and painted the doorframe of their house with the blood. You can find this in Exodus 12, beginning with verse 5. This is God's instruction. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. And God goes on to instruct them 
that not a bone of the animal was to be broken. And what they did not eat, they were to burn. And the Jewish slaves were told, when you eat that meat, have your coat on and your sandals ready and your staff in your hand because you need to be ready to leave and leave in a hurry. Verse 12, on that same night, God said, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. Now, that original Passover was eaten without yeast because if they were going to leave in a hurry they didn't have time for the bread to rise. Okay? And also, in the Bible, yeast was often a symbol of sin. And they were to be pure people. Well, it happened just as it says in the Bible. Okay, Ch Chuck Swindoll called that night the night that nobody slept. And it must have been a creepy night. Okay, the Bible says that in the slave camp, not even a dog was barking. The Jewish fathers smeared the blood of that sacrificed lamb over the door frame of their house and probably thought, I'm going to put a double coat on here just to make sure that the angel can see it. And that night the parents cradled their firstborn in their arms to protect them. Then in verse 29, Exodus 12, at midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the foreign throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. You know, if you've ever heard the cry of a grieving mother, it's something you'll never forget. But because of Pharaoh's hard heart and because of the Egyptians' abuse of these Israelite slaves for over 400 years, the parents in Egypt were wailing and mourning the loss of their firstborn child. But none of the Hebrew children died. God kept His promise. The angel of death passed over their home and their lives were spared. So in the middle of the night, Pharaoh contacted Moses and he said, I want you to get out of here. <laughs> you know, take your people and leave before we all die. Uh, just, you know, I've had enough, okay? And that night the slaves scurried out of Egypt. Now, God gave the Israelites specific instructions about how and when this Passover celebration or memorial was to be observed. There were some traditions that were added over the years, but the Passover week has always been a highlight of the Jewish calendar, the most festive time of the year. 1,500 years after the event of Passover, Jesus and His disciples came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival. And it was an extremely tense time. The religious leaders were so jealous of Jesus and His popularity, and so furious over His rebuke of their leadership, they conspired to assassinate Him. But they wanted to arrest Him without provoking a riot among His followers, with whom He was so popular. And so the treachery of Judas Iscariot solved their problem. Judas would lead the religious leaders to Him at night in a place away from the crowds, these men were perpetuating history's greatest crime during Israel's holiest festival. And in the middle of all this turmoil was Jesus. He was kind of like the eye of the hurricane. Everything was swirling all around Him, but He had a calmness. 
a peace that passes all understanding. Luke tells us, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now, picture this. Jerusalem is a city teeming with people. Every Jew within a 15 mile radius of the city had to celebrate Passover in the city. And every Jew in the world wanted to be there if they could. And so hundreds of thousands of people had descended on this city. There wasn't a room to be found anywhere. And Jesus tells two of his disciples, go into the city and find a room where we can celebrate the Passover in private. Well, you know, they had questions. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they ask. Jesus replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Now, Peter and John must have had a busy day. They had to buy groceries. They had to purchase an approved lamb. They had to make sure the lamb was slain in the temple. They had to have time to roast the lamb. They had to set the table, pour the wine. And they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And everything was prepared. Jesus and the disciples arrived. Everybody was excited. But the disciples did not know that this was going to be the night when they would not get much uninterrupted sleep. Now, imagine for a minute this, this uh, supper from the point of view of Jesus and his disciples. Okay? The, the, actually, the Passover meal hasn't changed much in the past 3,500 years. Okay? The meal as a whole is called a Seder. The word Seder means order. Everything is done in the right order. Every step is rich in symbolism. And so the leader would open with the Kadesh, which is a prayer of blessing. And then they were going to drink from the cup. There were actually four different cups. And drinking from the cup was going to be interspersed throughout the Seder meal, which would take about two and a half hours. <clears throat> the first cup is the cup of sanctification. They were to be sanctified people. They were to be people set apart, distinctive from the world. And everybody would drink from that cup. Then everybody would get up from the table and go to a place in the room where there was a basin. And they would ceremoniously wash their hands as a sign that they would receive the Passover meal with clean hands. And I take it that might have been the point at which Jesus took the basin and washed the feet of his disciples. That's a job that would have ordinarily been performed by one of the disciples or by a slave at the door. But the disciples, remember, were, they were busy, you know, arguing about who was going to be the chief of staff in the new administration. Nobody was humble enough to wash feet. And so Jesus gave them a lesson in humility. And as they sat down, the leader would take some of the greens, maybe celery or parsley, and dip them in a bowl of salt water and eat them dripping in salt water as a symbol that their forefathers had been in tears as slaves in Egypt. Then the leader would take the unleavened bread of the Passover, called the matzah, and he would remove the middle of the unleavened bread. And the bread is actually wrapped in a linen package called the ichud, which has three separate compartments. Nobody knows why, okay? But, but the leader would take the matzah from the middle compartment of the ichud, break it in two, and then put the smaller of the two pieces back in the ichud. The larger piece would get wrapped in a napkin, and then the leader would say to the children something like, Close your eyes, no peeking. And then he would hide that larger piece of unleavened bread, maybe under the tablecloth or in the corner or somewhere. 
That particular piece of matzah is called the afikomen, and it's going to be eaten at the end of the meal. Okay? And now someone, some designated person, usually one of the children, would ask a question. And the question is, what does all this mean? Why are we doing this? And the leader would then pass the decanter of wine, and there was the filling of a second cup. But they didn't drink it yet. They just left it in front of their plate. And everyone present would then participate in retelling the story of the original Passover. They might use the items on the cedar plate, like they say, we eat these greens dipped in salt water to remember that we are people of tears. And we eat of the unleavened bread as a reminder that we had to leave Egypt in a hurry. And we eat the lamb as a reminder that the lamb was sacrificed and the blood was put on the door frame so the angel of death would pass over us. And they would recount the whole story. They would recount the, the ten plagues. And each time they recounted a plague, they would dip their finger in this second cup of wine, this cup of deliverance, and they would place a drop of wine onto their plate. And they would remember each plague, water turned to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, the plague on cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, the death of the firstborn. And they were reminded that we have all escaped from these plagues. And then a piece of matzah was taken and dipped into what was called the maror. And the maror was like horseradish, bitter herbs. And they would dip the matzah into the maror, and it might even be so hot that it would bring tears to their eyes, but it was a reminder of the bitter years of bondage in Egypt. And it was at this point that Jesus said, one of you here at this table is going to betray me. And they all said, who, 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 is it me, is it me? And Jesus said, the one who dips his hand with me in the dish. And Jesus reached to dip the matzo into the maror, and Judas did the same thing. And Jesus turned to him and said, what you do, you do quickly. And it was a bitter deed that Judas performed, and it brought tears to many. Then, very quickly, they would dip their matzah into what is known as the karaseth. And the karaseth is made up of apples and dates and raisins and honey, all ground together. And they would eat the karaseth as a counter to the bitter herbs. And then they would drink the second cup, the cup of deliverance. Which reminds me, way back, a long time ago, my family, we were um, um, house parents at an Episcopalian ranch in Nevada, and our oldest son, Seth, was like two years old. And we celebrated this cedar meal um, just before Easter, I think it was on, on Monday, Thursday, as a celebration at the ranch. And everybody drinks from the, cu the cup of wine, and everybody eats all the stuff. And Seth went along with all this, you know, but after the second sip of wine, Seth started acting funny. He started laughing hilariously. He started making funny faces and stuff. It was the first and maybe the only time that I ever saw my son drunk, okay? <laughs> Two years old. But anyway, the Kereseth reminded them of the mortar that they as slaves had ground up in order to build the pyramids or whatever other pro projects the Egyptians forced them to build. And then finally at the end, the meal was eaten and they would eat the lamb and more matzo and the greens. And it was during that meal, I take it, that the disciples were bickering about who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus told Peter, huh, one of you is going to deny me three times. And then came time for the third cup, the cup of redemption. And so everybody had their cup filled, but they wouldn't drink it yet. And the leader would say, usually to the youngest child, okay, you can find the um, afikomen now. We're ready for that matzah that is to be eaten at the end of the meal. And the little ones would go scurrying around looking for the afikomen, and they would bring it out, and it would be broken as a sign of family unity. And the reason the child was so excited to find the afikomen was to get it back 
to the leader because the leader would have to pay a ransom price to get it back from the kid. Okay? Some kind of gift to the child. Well, at this point in this meal, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Let's see, I'm behind here. He took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, just think about the symbolism of all of this, okay? Jesus' body is without sin. Just like the unleavened bread, there's no fault in him. He is like the perfect lamb prepared for the sacrifice, without defect. His body was broken for us, but none of his bones were broken, just like the bones of the lamb were not broken. But his head was pierced, his back was lacerated, his hands and feet were nailed, and his side was punctured. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. But then his body was hidden away in a tomb. And three days later, the disciples went looking for it. And the youngest disciple, John, went in the tomb first. And Peter and John both went in the tomb, and they saw an angel who said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. And when they saw Jesus alive again, they rejoiced because they understood that Jesus had given his life as a ransom for their sin. Their freedom was purchased by the ransom of Jesus Christ on the cross. They were free. Well, it was then that Jewish people would drink the third cup, the cup of redemption. And the Bible says that after the meal, Jesus took the cup and he said to his disciples, in the same way, after the supper, it says, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus poured out his blood so that we can be transformed, so that we can symbolically take his blood and smear it on the door frames of our hearts and souls. And one day, the angel of death will pass over us. And Jesus was identified by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a Lamb without blemish or defect. So Jesus and his disciples partook of the third cup to remember that not only was his body broken, but his blood was shed. And then the Bible says they sang a hymn and they got up and left for the Mount of Olives. But apparently Jesus did not partake of the fourth cup, which is the cup of praise. The Jewish people in the Cedar celebration would pour out the fourth cup and then recount the story of Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament. And they would say that Elijah is going to come and he's going to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And in fact, in the Seder celebration, there's an empty chair at the Passover meal so that if Elijah happens to stop by, there will be a place for him. Okay? And the door is kept open when they participate in the Seder in case the Messiah comes. They want him to know that he is welcome there. And if Jewish people, as they drink this last cup, are not in Jerusalem, their toast is, next year in Jerusalem. And this annual Seder meal gives the Jewish people ties to their history and to their heritage. It gives them family ties. It gives them deep roots. But Jesus did not drink from this fourth cup. He knew that Elijah had already come. John the Baptist had come in the spirit of Elijah to announce that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus knew that he was the Messiah. He had already walked through the door. And so Jesus said, I will not drink again of this cup until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And they left. 
Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. I go to prepare a, a way for you. And Jesus went to the cross. And he allowed his blood to be smeared on that cross as a promise to us that we are redeemed. We belong to him. And the death angel will pass over us and we will have a new home and we will be released from the slavery of sin. Now, whenever we celebrate communion, it's the greatest memorial of all time. Okay? First, because of its magnitude. We're not just remembering somebody who did something good for their country. Okay? We're remembering the Lamb of God who shed his blood for the sins of the world. And when we gather around the Lord's table, when we participate in communion today, I hope you'll come with a heart of repentance. Because, you know, it, it wasn't the Jewish people, it wasn't the Roman soldiers, it wasn't the traitor disciple who was responsible for the death of Jesus, okay? It was the sins of all of us. The Bible says, upon him was laid the iniquity of Joe. Anybody awake? No, the iniquity of who? The iniquity of us all. On him was laid, laid the iniquity of us all. So when we come to the Lord's table, we need to realize how horrendous our sins are that caused Christ to be nailed to the cross. And when we drink the communion cup, it's in a sense the fourth cup, the cup of praise, because we're so thankful for what Jesus did for us. Number two, the Lord's Supper is the greatest memorial of all because of its endurance. It's not made of marble or stone. It's made of bread and wine that will spoil in a matter of just a few days. But it is a memorial that has lasted 2,000 years. Number three, it's the greatest memorial of all because of its availability. You don't even have to go to Jerusalem or to Washington, D.C. It's a memorial that's celebrated in every corner of the world on the Lord's Day. You know, when Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, he requested a moment of silence and asked everyone at Mission Control to give thanks, and he took from his personal pack some bread and a chalice and a vial of wine. He poured the wine, which in one-sixth of the Earth's gravity kind of curled up the sides of the chalice and acted funny, okay? And then he celebrated communion. The first liquid ever consumed on the moon was the consecrated sacrament representing the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You won't read about that in history books, but you can fact check me, okay? Well, number four, the Lord's Supper is the greatest memorial of all time because you can participate in it. You don't just look at it from a distance. It takes all five of your senses. You see it, you touch it, you smell it, you taste it, you hear it, you participate in it. You are edified and strengthened, okay? In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we uh, give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is it not the bread, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? There's a, a very famous picture at the Vietnam Wall which shows a mother and young daughter standing at the wall, reaching out with their hands to touch the name of their husband and father who had died. But the reflection in the wall is not a reflection of the mother and daughter, but an image of the one who had died reaching out his hand to touch theirs. Now, in a very real sense, when you reach out to take the bread and the cup, the hand of Jesus is offering it to you in a mystical way. Okay? Jesus is the one who invites us to the communion table and serves us these representations of his body and his blood. And finally, it's the greatest memorial of all time because it's a memorial of hope. 
It's not just looking back at somebody who died and rose again. It's also looking forward to the day when Jesus will come again. The Bible says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, whenever, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And there's this sense spiritually that we receive communion with our coats on and our sandals ready and our staff in our hand, ready to go at any moment, and we're standing vigil. We're proclaiming to the world that we believe that Jesus is alive, we believe Jesus is coming back, and we believe that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare our hearts to participate in this sacred meal, I pray that you would lead us back to that upper room and lead us into the presence of Jesus and allow us to receive from his hand the bread and the cup and allow us to see, to receive from you, God our Father, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our service this morning, as we prepare to receive our communion, can you stand and, and we'll contemplate those words of our sermon as we continue with new wine.
For those of you present uh, in the building today, you were given this little two-step communion cup to participate. Uh, in the very top, there's a wafer representing the uh, body of Christ. And then the second layer is the cup. Okay. We have recounted the story today. But as we do at every communion service, virtually every communion service all over the world by all Christians <laughs> include the words that Jesus spoke. And what Jesus said was this, this is my body which is given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And as we read today, Jesus also said, this is my cup of the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this bread and for this cup. May they be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And remind us that we receive our freedom from his hand and from his sacrifice. And that we have the ability to look forward to our complete freedom when Jesus comes again. Bless this meal, we pray. And hear us as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let's stand and sing praises together.
is like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my Take me to the riverside, take me under baptized, I need you, oh God, I need you, your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, it's like the sound of a symphony to my ears, it's like hope. Well, next week we're going to conclude this series on more about Jesus and then guess what? It's going to be Lent. Okay? A week from this Wednesday on the 17th is uh, Ash Wednesday and we're actually going to celebrate Ash Wednesday. Our staff is creating a virtual Ash Wednesday celebration. Okay? And that's only, it's not going to be here. It's only going to be online. But if you want to, to participate, you can pick up some ashes and some instructions on your way out the door today at the Welcome Center. And there will be more information about it as we get a little bit closer to February 17th as well. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us online from the parking lot, from the Friendship Center, and from all over the world. Bless you, and we'll see you next week. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>